AI governance is a very hot topic right now. We've seen calls for pauses on AI, for companies like DeepMind and OpenAI to commit to not scaling up their models further, and interest from countries around the world in understanding and regulating AI systems. But AI governance is still in its infancy, and US policymakers are still in the process of exploring and considering numerous options for how we might regulate it. Questions abound. Should we regulate the basic technology, its use, or both? How do we ensure safety without stifling progress? My guest today, Devyant Kaushik, is the Associate Director for Emerging Technologies and National Security at the Federation for American Scientists. For years, he's been on the ground with policymakers doing the hard work to figure out how we can craft policies for a world with AI and how to make those policies a reality. We spoke about the mundanity of the policymaking process, what considerations policymakers are entertaining about AI, recent legislative proposals, how hype can lead to bad regulation, and plenty besides. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you enjoy these episodes, you can follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. You can also follow us on Substack to get regular notifications whenever we release a new article, newsletter, or podcast episode. You can also find our online magazine at thegradient.pub, where we regularly publish essays by the sorts of people I interview on the podcast. And finally, if you enjoy the episode, it would mean a great deal to us all if you'd consider leaving us a review on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this episode. It helps more listeners like you find what we're doing and helps us bring in more interesting guests for you to listen to. But now, without further ado, Divyansh Kaushik. Divyansh, you're now the Associate Director for Emerging Technologies and National Security at the Federation of American Scientists, and you just released this article in Vox that I found very interesting on the subject of AI regulation and some of the disanalogies between AI and nuclear weapons, which is something that a lot of people seem to compare. I'd love to rewind a little bit, though, first to talk a bit about how you got into AI in the first place, and perhaps how that evolved a little bit into your work on policy. Thanks, Daniel, for having me on the podcast. This is, that's a great question you just asked, like, because I've been thinking about like tracing my steps back, how I got here, how I got into doing my machine learning PhD. Yeah. I think it was like when I went into undergrad, you know, doing it well, computer science, uh, talked to this particular professor. She was <clears throat> very inspiring. And she thought, she she kind of pointed me into this direction to start doing some like lowball uh, machine learning projects, uh, which were great. Uh, <laughs> and that kind of spurred my interest. Uh, I always liked math. My dad uh, teaches math to high school kids. So I was like, yeah, uh, this this kind of combines my computer science uh, interests and my love for math together. Uh, and I was never gonna do a pure math PhD. Let's let's just be honest. I was not not gonna do that. You know, uh, that requires like a special set of willpower. Very even, exactly. Was, so this was the next best thing. Uh, I applied to a couple of master's programs. I was still not sure about PhD. Got into CMU, uh, was thinking of working on machine learning for healthcare. So I reached out to Zach and Zach hadn't even joined CMU yet. Like I joined CMU August of 2017. Zach started at CMU in Jan 2018. And so when Zach started, you know, we started brainstorming what kinds of projects we might want to do. And in one of the projects we kind of explored a tangent, uh, we were like, oh, are these question answering models actually doing what they say they're doing, right? Like, are they actually looking at the question and the answer, the uh, question and the passage to come up with the answer? We did some exploration, turned out, wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, 
that became my first paper. The gods of uh, reviewing aligned with me and gave that paper the best paper award, which was like very, like it felt really good and terrifying at the same time. It was like, yes, okay, now I know that I can do research. Also terrifying that I've set very high expectations right in my first year. Like, that's just like not how you do it. There's only way, there's only one way from there and that's down. Like, either you get like best papers all the way through and you stay flat or the next paper is not going to be a best paper and that's, you're going down now. <laughs> Like that, that was my validation that yes, I can do research and I wanted to do a, a more of that work. So I applied for PhD programs and that's how I ended up doing a machine learning PhD. Yeah. I mean, I guess I first want to comment that I guess it's, it's tough to start off with the best paper, but I think that it feels to me kind of well-deserved. And I, I remember, um, I, I did interview your, your advisor, Prof Lipton, uh, quite a few months ago. And I think that your work with him and a lot of his other work really encouraged me, I think, and probably a lot of other people too, to examine and, and think about the other work that they read a lot more critically. I think that you put this to a lot of a lot of different tests, as you said, like RQA models really doing what they say. I think that's something that maybe we form intuitions about and sometimes as a result make assumptions about. But the kind of work that you all have done, I mean, I think it's it's very important because it forces the rest of us to think a bit more critically when we're looking at other things. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I think if we were able to change one person's mind into like thinking uh, things more critically, that it was worth it. I have to give a lot of credit to Zach for inspiring me to think critically about things. So uh, I, I think he, he has that uh, thing going on with people where he just like forces them to think about things uh, from a critical perspective that, yeah, w one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from him was never read a paper from the perspective that, oh, yeah, I agree with this, whatever is being written. Yeah. Try to find what you like, what's wrong here or what could be done better. Like, you know, it, it may turn out that there's nothing wrong and that's very good. But if it does turn out like there are some things missing, like it one enhances your critical abilities, but two also gives you ideas for like what you might want to do in the future. That's kind of how most of my research ended up being. Uh, so I have to thank him for that. I like that framework for doing this. So I, I think this is maybe a, a good mindset too that we can bring into the world of policy when we kind of get there. Question every assumption. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so I'm curious, of course, Prof Lipton's lab kind of does span a lot of a lot of domains. And so I would imagine I believe your your policy interest kind of started while you were doing that PhD. And I'm curious how that evolved for you. Uh, yeah, uh, I so I started working on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, in 2018, which was the signature Republican Tax Cuts Bill that passed the House on a party line vote was going to go through the Senate as well. Uh, there was one issue in that bill, which was going to tax graduate student tuition waivers as income. So you get your PhD student getting, I don't know, $30,000 in stipend, but your university has waived off your 50,000 tuition. Okay. Uh, now 80,000 is going to be considered income for you and you'll pay taxes on 80, even though you're only seeing 30. The remaining 50, the university is just moving from one bank account to another. So I, I got involved through that. Uh, you know, I uh, was working with Senator Toomey, uh, who was a leading voice on the se Senate side on this bill. And fortunately, he represented Pennsylvania. And I was at Carnegie Mellon, so we had a we had an end with the office. We talked to him, just like a student-led effort. That spurred my interest more into working on policy, especially when we were able to successfully kill that provision in the Senate with his help. Uh, so I, I saw the kind of impact policy could have on people, on the number of people and the, the level of impact, right? Uh, so I started 
getting more and more involved. Uh, I got to work on the Chips and Science Act, uh, got to work on a uh, couple other provisions like now, you know, uh, fellowship income uh, for graduate students is considered eligible for IRA accounts, which it was not previously. So like all these wins that we were able to achieve uh, that made me think more and more of policy as a career that I could pursue, especially when I saw like the Mark Zuckerberg or original Mark Zuckerberg hearing in the house that was like, okay, like there's a dire need of people who know the tech deep down and people who can speak policy, who understand the policy issues, who understand the regulatory regime uh, to be working more closely. Uh, and I sat at the intersection, so uh, found this, this job to be a natural fit as well. I got a lot of uh, encouragement from my mentors at CMU to pursue this, like not just Zach, but also my other advisor, Ed Hovey, the university president. Uh, he's He's been a great mentor, uh, Arnim, uh, the former, former CMU vice pro president for research, like uh, Michael McQuaid, he's, he's a great guy. Like he's, anything I do wrong, like you can just blame, and blame it on him. Uh, anything I do right, I'm happy to take the credit. I like that system. I want to get into more detail on how this manifests in AI later, but maybe just as a, a general point of understanding, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about some of the realities of what policymaking tends to look like, because I think that there's often this mismatch between how people conceive of policy and what they really pay attention to, all of these big things happening at the national level, things that look very exciting, these CEO hearings and that, of course, dominates the mind when somebody thinks about policy. But on the other hand, a lot of it, people who actually had their boots on the ground doing stuff, a lot of it is not that glamorous. It's coalition building. It's bothering people about things. It's making connections with the right people. And so I, I suppose I'm curious in your own experience, if that disconnect manifested at all, was there something that maybe you felt was pretty unexpected for you as you were getting into policy? How do you think about it maybe now? And do you feel that your your view on doing policy has, has evolved much? Yeah, my first year was quite a shocker for me that way. I would say that it, uh, that is true. Like, you know, a lot of people see the news and think of all these high profile hearings and events as the way policy is done. And I'll tell you, it's boring. Like the policy making process, the, the way it is, it is just a very boring process. You have to spend countless hours uh, doing coalition building, as you said, you know, you have to, you have to bring together a lot of stakeholders. You have to help convince a lot of people why what you're saying matters. You have to do original research to come up with good data to back what you're saying uh you need it's it's not just about uh hey science says so it's also okay what are the uh, what you know what do economists say what do uh stakeholders in my district say what are the what are the unions saying what are the employers saying uh, what are the small businesses saying you know uh there are a lot of factors at play. Uh, it is not just like, oh, science says X, so X should happen. That's just, uh, and so like I found most of my time goes in just like talking to people, just talking to them, trying to better understand where they're coming from. That is key. Like if you are trying to persuade somebody of to, agree with what you are trying to say, you have to first understand that you cannot have, like, you cannot go into the room without having a good understanding of where that person's coming from. You have to recognize everybody in here wants to do, like genuinely believes that they are trying to do good. You may disagree with their policies uh, and that's fair and appropriate. That is how a democracy works. Uh, and the nature of compromise then is like, 
you you come up with something you understand where they're coming from you talk and talk and talk and talk maybe there's one thing that you two agree on you know there are out of a hundred things there's one thing you agree on now you pick on that one thing and you start building on top of that don't start with your disagreements start with what you agree on build that coalition that is important uh you may be like i'd say some people want to achieve everything in one go and that's laudable like that is an admirable goal. Uh, I would love to do that one day, maybe uh, achieve everything in one go. But at the end of the day, singles are just as important as home runs. Yeah, you got to put runs on the board, uh, put runs on the board. And at the end of the ninth inning, let's just call the score. On the set of topics related to AI policy, and as somebody who, who followed these sometimes, I get the sense that maybe opinions on the policies to adopt, things we should be doing, they maybe don't divide as cleanly along party lines as some other issues do. But I'm curious about your experience with that, because when it comes to coalition building, I know that the I'm a Republican, I can't agree with you because you're a Democrat and vice versa often becomes a big issue. I think... uh... There's more of an appearance of a divide than there is actually on most issues. Like, sure, there are certain hot button issues where there is a, you can say, you know, there's more or less a clear divide. But I would put those issues as maybe like 5% of overall issues. It's just that those 5% of the issues get most of the airtime. Uh, So it feels like there is this big divide where Republicans and Democrats don't work together, uh, don't agree on most of the things or whatever, like, you know, uh, it's, it's just very fascinating to see, but I do think most people agree on a lot of things. Uh, there are way too many bipartisan hearings, a lot of bipartisan bills that come out, uh, a lot of bipartisan bills that get enacted. So on AI, I think that is, that is also the case here. Like, uh, you see, uh, Senator Blumenthal and Senator Hawley having a bipartisan hearing. You see Senator Ossoff and Senator Blackburn having a bipartisan hearing on AI and human rights. Uh, You you see the gang of four that Senator Schumer started, Schumer, Young, Heinrich Rounds. Uh, You see the Create AI Act that was presented by Senator Heinrich, Senator Rounds, Senator Young, and Senator Booker, two Republicans, two Democrats uh, on that one. Uh, with very wide, very different perspectives on a lot of policies. Um, like be, when you when you start like disintegrating like overall big picture issue into like nitty gritty smaller like what's what exactly do we need? To do? Oh, should we provide compute to community colleges and small universities and small businesses to be able to develop AI models or red team existing models? Turns out a lot of people agree, uh, right? But if you start saying, here's my big, like bold unicorn idea uh, that will solve all the ills of AI policy in one bill, I think you'll start seeing people will disagree with a lot of that, right? People agree, you, you start to form a, you know, a coalition that agrees with you when you start small, when you start on things that Yes, there, I don't think there's consensus on the Hill around like big ideas like licensing right now, but there is a general consensus that it is important to provide community colleges with compute access to small public universities, uh, with compute access, teaching universities with compute access so that they can provide students, uh, with hands-on AI experience, hands-on AI training, uh, especially if you know, there's going to be a big impact on middle skill jobs, then yeah, we got to upskill people. Yeah, this this makes a lot of sense. Let's dive into a couple of the specific types of policies that you've looked at in your time. And I think that may be two places to start. One is a little bit broader, but of course applies to AI, is the writing you did on the impact of international scientists, engineers, students on US research outputs and global competitiveness, which of course, given the desire for AI talent in the United States is a really big topic right now. But 
Tell me a little bit about how you think about this issue, the fact that I think the U.S., it has often made it a little bit harder for for many people who want to come in and contribute their talents than they or we perhaps would like it to be. But tell me a little bit about some of the issues you've seen and perhaps what you've seen in terms of how we can move ourselves to a better place on this. That's a great question. And that is also an issue where it seems that there is a lot of divide between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but I think two weeks ago, there was a bill, uh, or two or three weeks ago, there was a bill that was introduced in the U.S. Senate. Uh, Senator Mike Rounds and Senator Dick Durbin, you know, Mike Rounds, Senator Rounds being Republican from South Dakota, Dick Durbin being Democrat of Illinois, on uh, attracting and retaining STEM PhD and master's degree holders who get who graduate from U.S. universities uh, with certain conditions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of bipartisanship over there. There was a House China Select Committee hearing last week, uh, or last last week, I think last week, on uh, emerging tech competitiveness. And the Republican witness was Josh Wolf, uh, founder of Lux Capital. And his thing was, hey, guys, you know what? Morris Chang used to work at Texas Instruments and keep him. We could have had Texas Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation rather than TSMC, uh, the Taiwanese uh, company. And so, you know, uh, Josh, being the Republican witness, was calling on Congress to fix immigration reform. There was a letter that went out in May with 70 national security leaders, including former President Trump's Deputy Secretary of Defense, his uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, a lot of his undersecretaries of defense, his Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, you know, people going all the way back to the Ford administration signed on saying, Congress, you really need to fix this this time. So uh, I think there is a growing recognition that you know, if you really want to set the rules of the road on AI, you need the talent here. Uh, you know, other countries, whether it's China or Russia, they have a very, they have a clear talent strategy. You know, for instance, China has about four times the population we do, right? They can self-sustain uh, with their own population in terms of AI talent. They are already producing twice as many STEM PhDs as the United States, twice as many STEM masters. We have to recruit the rest of the world to work with us. Like we have to create a rest of the world team. Uh, you know, and, and so the idea of, you, you look at Ilya, right? Ilya was born in Russia, raised in Israel, uh, co-founded OpenAI, right? Uh, there, there are way too many examples of people like him uh, who are here and who are making sure that, you know, all these great companies are based here, All that all these amazing advances are happening here with like democratic ideals at their core, not like a dystopian social credit system or surveillance systems uh, that entrench government power over uh, minorities they want to repress. Uh, not a massive... Uh, gene genomic database of uh, a minority that you want to send to concentration camps right uh, and so if we want to set the rules of the road if you want to set the standards then we need the people here so that we are developing the technology responsibly we are we are identifying what are the capabilities going to be before the autocratic nations do that is a that is a very important aspect uh, so people are starting to realize that on AI, very much so. Uh, you know, Senator Rounds likes to say, imagine a world if we didn't let Albert Einstein into the country. Uh, I, we might all be speaking German, uh, if that happened. Uh, but, you know, uh, so it's it's important. And, and in that paper, like, for instance, we found, we looked at MIT faculty uh, and their uh you know, publications, their impact, and internet faculty born overseas were dramatically like overrepresented in terms of impact. 
partly because like there's a self-selection bias in terms of who are immigrating, right? Uh, and so there, there's like just a ton of research that has come out over the last couple of years on how immigrant entrepreneurs, uh, immigrant scientists, researchers, engineers are driving productivity. Uh, the I think the 2013 Gang of Eight bipartisan immigration bill that passed the Senate, uh, but did not get a vote in the House, the Congressional Budget Office had uh, assessed that it would have grown the U.S. economy by at least a trillion dollars or something. Uh, so, you know, imagine an extra trillion dollars lying that we could have used to research uh, new drugs for Alzheimer's, ALS, all the cures that we haven't been able to find because... I don't know. We don't have the money lying around, probably. Uh, but that's important, right? Like we we want the AI talent here because we want to develop it with democratic ideals at the core. Now, Canada started this new policy recently of like if you did not, if you have an H one B, if you have been approved for an H one B in the United States, and you want to move to Canada, just apply through this new portal. Ten, they had ten thousand slots, and they approved ten thousand people within forty eight hours. 10,000 people left the United States, moved to Canada in 48 hours because Canada created a new, really quick, a really smooth pathway for them to move. People will go where opportunity is. Do we want them here? Do we want them, you know, do we want them working on responsible development of technology here? Or do we want to create a hostile environment for them so they feel like it's better for them to go back to China and develop tech for the CCP. I think that's a question in my view. I agree. And we're going to have a lot of time to dive into specifics of the U.S. strategy and policy. But while we're here on the international question, as you've pointed out, and I think a substrate of a lot of what you're saying here, there is this posturing and this U.S. versus China sort of rhetoric that goes on a lot, of course. And I think that it is an important context to have when we're thinking about our own AI ecosystem. And at the same time, I think there is definitely some mixed discourse and maybe disagreements on how useful it is to posture or think about China in particular terms and perhaps without as much of an understanding of their history and where they come from. I'm not saying that, you know, if an autocratic or authoritarian regime is doing bad things, you know, I'm not saying let that slide, but that there may be some more complexity to the situation than sometimes the way people tend to speak about it betrays. That being said, as somebody who has spent time on these issues, I'm curious for your takes on this. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very nuanced issue. Anybody who paints it in a very simplistic manner, uh, is uh, probably doing some disservice. Uh, I do, however, want to say that things changed dramatically uh, with Xi. Like before Xi, there was a lot of desire to collaborate, reform some, some uh, you know, spec of reform. Like let's let's try. There was something there. Would she? The, the tides have turned a lot. It's more authoritarian. They are trying to exercise way more control. They're, you know, whether it's uh, in Xinjiang, where they are, you know, uh, not just engaging in human rights violations, but uh, as the State Department has labeled they're conducting a genocide. Uh, in Hong Kong, they are where the national security law that was passed. Uh, is repressing people. Uh, and how, like, the New York Times itself had this uh, article a couple of years ago about, like, how the facial recognition system uh, systems being developed in China are being used to oppress the Uyghur minority. Uh, they have a... So with Xi, like, the policies have changed dramatically that they've, they now have a civil-military fusion system which is that any civilian technology developed for any purposes can and will be used for military purposes. Whereas we do not, no other country, well, maybe except Russia, North Korea, Iran, and probably a few others, uh, a democratic country will not do that. 
You know, it is not that, hey, you Stanford professor, you developed that for civilian purposes. You have to hand it over to the U.S. Army, uh, whatever you've developed, all the patterns and everything, right? We're not going to do that. It's it's a free society. Uh, so that's kind of like, that's what changed the equation over there, right? Uh, the increasing uh, threats in the South China Sea, uh, you know, the new artificial islands being developed, the uh, hostage taking off like smaller countries through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, you know, trying to scare tai- Taiwan and Taiwanese people into like, hey, we are going to take you over in 2027. Um, that's just like, th- that has created this new environment where people are starting to recognize the threat that exists. Now, at the same time, I would say that, yes, not everything that we do should be done because China. There are things we have to do just because for our own good. (laughs) I I see this like, like during the Cold War, we were doing a lot of things because because Russia, because the Soviet Union, right? we were investing heavily into our space program because we were competing with the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union uh, crumbled. It did not, ex- you know, once once the Soviet Union did not exist anymore, we kind of stopped funding NASA. Uh, now it's China and we're like, oh, we got to send a man to the moon again. Uh, we got to invest in AI. We got to invest in quantum. Uh, to do this, that, and I am all for that. I am all for those investments. I just think that at times, maybe we, we are taking our eye off the ball that those things we should be doing anyhow for our own good to maintain that lead and that advantage, not, not just when uh, a peer competitor emerges, um, you know, today it's China, maybe tomorrow it will be someone else, uh, Investing in R and D, investing in scientific research, staying ahead in terms of technology and development—that is something we should be doing for the good of our own people uh, at any time. Like, and competition with China should, like, you know, staying ahead in the competition with China should naturally emerge as a byproduct. That would be the idealistic view. I would like to see that at some point. That's not the practical view, I would say, especially on the hill when you have to like sell things, <laughs> right? Like it is, it is like, because a lot of people are able to relate to what is happening over there and are able to relate to like comparisons, right? Like I can say that our AI ecosystem is here today and we should try to have it here, you know, somewhere else, but in five years. It is hard to relate to that versus saying, look, this is where China is today. And this is where we are. And we have to stay ahead of them. Like that is easier to relate. Uh, that and that is just my personal view. It does not represent what FAS would say probably. Uh, like, um, uh, but I'm saying like, you know, it is both have their own merits. It is important to, to understand and be prepared for the China threat. Uh, and when I mean the China threat, I specifically mean the PRC and the CCP, not the Chinese people. Uh, and the second thing, we should also be doing these things just because they are good for us normally. Yeah, it, it does seem, especially when it comes to the question of AI, that there has been a lot of foot dragging on the part of the US. Maybe foot dragging isn't the exact way to put it. But certainly when it comes to trying to form a coherent national strategy, it seems like we haven't spent nearly as much time or gone as fast on it as many of our peers. Of course, China has been thinking about this for quite a while. I know they had their 2030 development plan quite some time ago, along with many other things besides. And as one of my former guests, Matt Sheehan, has kind of written about extensively, They have really been launching what are probably some of the most large-scale experiments in in AI regulation and governance in the world. And 
through doing that, they are going to have a lot more data on what works and what doesn't. If they are out there actually seeing how this works, while we're still struggling to put together different things. And I suppose part of this is artifacts of the different ways in which we tend to govern. When you can govern with an iron fist, it is easier to say, well, we have this law now. Let's implement it. Let's see how it works, as opposed to having to do a lot of the coalition building, all these things that you are doing in your work and building from the ground up there. And so I think that there's maybe also this artifact of, well, we also have to struggle with that difference and maybe some of the limitations or differences it puts in how we can do policy. I think there are probably advantages we derive from it as well, but probably a- another thought just to integrate there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is some truth to that. Uh, at the same time, I to play the devil's advocate, I would say, look, the CCP's view is clear. They're all for surveillance and collecting data as long as, it, as it's them and not the private companies in China which has kind of put their private sector at a disadvantage compared to the private sector in other countries uh, on AI. The other thing that has put them at a disadvantage is there's not enough training data in Mandarin as there is in English, right? Uh, So it is is interesting. And maybe they will innovate in a way where they are able to find newer ways to train models with similar capabilities using uh, smaller amounts of data. That's possible. But so far we've seen that there are, you know, the Baidu, uh, Ernie bot, that's it's far behind what the US models are uh, doing right now. And I don't know like whether the application of specific laws over there will be able to tr- like that we'll be able to translate the lessons one to one over here or any other country given the dynamics that are play the other thing i would say uh i think there is there is something good about how the policy making process happens in the us uh the united states congress is designed in a way or actually the founders designed it in a way uh i believe to not pass very bad laws, to stop bad, bad laws from passing, stop uh, authoritarianism from happening. Uh, uh, Like there is so much inertia. Like some people think that, oh, wow, common sense things aren't happening at the pace they should be happening. At the same time, really bad things aren't happening either that are happening in a lot of other countries. Like, I mean, hey, look, GDPR was very well-intentioned very, very well intentioned, I'd say. All it's done is made the internet worse, <laughs> uh, right? And that law would have never been enacted in the US, right? Uh, so it's it's a different system. It works and it works for, somehow works for good. So let's, let's just keep it, uh, I'd say. Uh, I think the inside forums that Senator Schumer is going to start doing after the fall, uh, after the August recess, I think they're going to be good. They're going to spur some uh, good ideas. They're going to sprout some good ideas in the minds of senators on what they might want to do. I think they're also going to potentially accelerate the uh, urgency uh, in terms of, like, accelerate the timeline for legislating, right? Uh, Because you have to understand, like, Congress has a lot going on, right? They've got... NDAA, they've got they got to fund the government. They have the farm bill that needs to be reauthorized. They have to reauthorize NASA. They have to reauthorize the FAA. They have to do the National Farm Administrative Act reauthorization. And these are just like a few of the many bills that they have to do. Uh, the AI bill will happen, as as Senator Schumer keeps putting, like it's about months, not years. Uh, and I think like they will come to an agreement recognizing how how transformative this technology is that we have to do something. We can't just like leave it out there. At the same time, I would also point that nothing in the existing law says that it doesn't apply to AI. You know, the Civil Rights Act does not say that, oh yes, you 
you're fine discriminating against people if you're doing it algorithmically. You know, there's nothing in the Civil Rights Act that says that. So all those decisions, uh, all the algorithmic decisions, uh, they're they're they have to comply with the Civil Rights Act too. They have to comply with the Fourth Amendment. You can't just like you're not just like allowed to do illegal surveillance. You're not just like allowed to do surveillance if you're doing it using autom- uh, automated tools. Uh, you know, your Fourth Amendment rights to privacy also apply on AI. Uh, your right to due process also applies to AI, uh, right? Like your civil liberties protections also apply to AI. Uh, it's it's like nothing in the law says that yeah, you know what? We have a we have an exception for if you were to do this using AI. There is a great opportunity for the Biden administration to build up state capacity in the meantime, you know? Like w- by the time Congress acts, which maybe next year, maybe a year from now, we don't know, hopefully next year, uh they can build state capacity for implementing those laws. You know? Uh they can also like extract more voluntary commitments like they did with the companies recently. Let's just open up the participation to every other company that wants to participate in that voluntary commitment. Right. Uh, they can, they can also issue executive orders to do some things. Uh, right. And then finally, I think, uh, one other thing that people need to pay more attention to is there are things happening in Congress on AI. Uh, you know, the, FY 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, the Senate version, has a lot of things around like a watermarking competition, a bug bounty for AI models. Uh, Senator uh, Gary Peters, who chairs the Senate Homeland Services and Government Affairs Committee, uh, his he has passed like a lot of bills through his committee, uh, like three bill, uh, well, two bills he's passed. One is the AI Leadership Training Act uh, to provide federal government leaders training on AI. Uh, Required disclosure from agencies. Uh, If an agency is using a predictive model to do something, uh, they have to disclose it, right? He's working on, he's released this new bill on procurement guidance for agencies. Uh, When agencies do procure some AI, uh, any tool that uses AI, what are the, uh, things that they have to do, like what are the rules they have to follow there? Those are important things. You know, he's like, so I think like right now, I would say those things, you know, the building state capacity, the bills that Senator Peters is doing, the NDAA kind of efforts, those are building the runways, the bridges, the tunnels for the trucks and the airplanes and everything else to move that will come later. Yeah, I, I appreciate your articulation of all this. And I think that the the way you put the U.S.'s advantages in a lot of these domains is really clarifying. I'd love to talk a little bit more about your thoughts on how Congress can kind of balance the competing sets of priorities and other things it might have to deal with at this point. So kind of coming to your thoughts on how Congress can sort of balance these things of, well, we want to impose some level of governance on AI, but we don't want to well, stifle innovation. I think that's a very classic trade-off that people think about when hearing about regulations in general. And in this article, you posed a couple of things. And I guess, excitingly, you had been advocating for this National AI Research Resource, which I understand recently there was a directive to fund that. So that's really exciting. But I'd love to hear how you think about this trade-off more broadly and some of the specific suggestions you have. So I think... uh... There are a lot of things that need to be considered here, right? Like, first, do you regulate it at source or do you regulate it as a, uh, at, you know, on the use cases? And I think uh, the answer probably isn't or. The answer is probably and, right? Like, it's a dual use technology, right? You have to understand. Everybody recognizes that. You can use it for civilian purposes. You can use it for military purposes. Uh, you can use it for nefarious use cases. Uh, so there has to be some form of compute governance there uh, to prevent really bad actors from you from getting their hands on it. Whether that comes in the form of export controls, whether that comes in the form of some, you know, uh, 
some kind of a licensing regime that does not completely throw open source under the bus. I think all of that will first require us to define what are the national security implications. Is it a national security threat for Claude 2 or GPT-4 to generate a response to my query about bioweapons? Right? There, like, one thing is, can I already get that information from the internet? Easily, perhaps. Uh, and if so, then it becomes a bit murky to define whether that's a national security threat. The second thing is, if it is generating new information, is that information accurate? I would, I would say like if, if someone walks up to you on the street and asks you, hey, how do I, gen how do I create a bioweapon? You could respond with gibberish. Uh, I, I would, resp I, uh, you know, if, if someone puts a gun to my head and asks me how to make a bioweapon, I'll probably respond with gibberish. Like, uh, try you to say something, but not I'll much. I, I don't know a thing about bioweapons uh, or how to make them, thank God. Uh, and that's not a, I don't think that's a national, that's a national security threat. But if I was delivering them accurate information, right? and new information that doesn't already exist on a readily available source, right? Like, I feel like that is that is clearly a threat, right? Now, we have to assess, like, how do we measure those? How do we map and measure those impacts? Uh, that's, and I think, like, that work has to happen now so that we can better assess, like, how to implement these things. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with licensing is, like, right now you can't define a threshold. Right. Where's the threshold? Like a lot of people say, oh, 80 billion parameters or more or whatever, two to the power 26 flops or whatever. I, sure, like, but that's not future-proof regulation. <laughs> Tomorrow, if innovation happens where you have a leaner model, like using lesser compute, getting the same or better performance, what are you going to do? Like if there's architectural innovation or there's innovation in terms of uh, training uh, paradigms or new kinds of data uh, labeling. So that's that's one of the things that we have to think deeper about. Like how do we define, how do we appropriately assess the national security implications here to regulate something at the source? And uh, we have to clearly assess that and then come up with what is the appropriate regulation at the source. And the second thing, of course, we are regulating things at the use case uh, on on the use case scenarios, right? Uh, we have to make sure that those laws are enforced. Uh, but there is a lot of gray area, and uh, potentially Congress will have to strengthen existing laws too, uh, create new laws, strengthen existing laws. Like, should uh, you know the the original version of Mid Journey uh, or no, sorry, Stable Diffusion that was used to create a uh, child pornography massive scale like it is illegal under the law to create child pornography even if it is fake like even if it just resembles a child it is illegal to do that to, to create it to disseminate it uh at the same time should we be making it easier for people to do it at scale like shouldn't uh the people creating mid journey be somewhat liable to it at least make a good faith effort to prevent creators from being able to do that, right? There are things that we have to look at there. Uh, it's not saying that we kill mid journey altogether that we, oh yeah, you can't just open source anything there, right? That That is, in my view, the last step that you take, right? You first figure out if I have a hundred levers to pull, are there levers that will achieve the same goal I want? One, models should not fall into the hands of uh, nefarious actors. Two, well, they shouldn't be uh, they shouldn't be used for like really nefarious use cases uh, or any nefarious use cases for that matter. But like three, you know, uh, yes, I'm also worried about catastrophic risks. Like, can we? prevent models from generating information about bioweapons. So can we prevent them from 
can we prevent worm GPT from happening? I don't know. Like, I would like to. Uh, I mean, see, like, there, there. It's easy to talk about existential risks uh, when, yeah. But it's hard to connect the dots from X to Y. What I would like to talk about is instead, what happens if, uh, you know, lot, two years ago there were five FSB officers who were indicted. Uh, with the charge of planting malware at a nuclear power plant in the United States. Uh, so Russian intelligence planted malware at a nuclear power plant in the United States two years ago. Now imagine a cat and mouse game going on where they have like really powerful models that are trying to evade our cybersecurity. And we are just, we are building up our cybersecurity. They're evading it. They're planting malware. Imagine a Keystone style hack every other week. Right. That is that is bad. That is really bad. Imagine people coming up with uh, using you know drug discovery algorithms to instead create new kinds of toxins or create new kinds of pathogens that are resistant to existing vaccines. I'm I'm not saying that that's happening right now, but that is something we have to be prepared for, right? Just as it is the responsibility of the government to be prepared for really bad things from happening. You know, cyclones don't happen every day, every year, but you have to be prepared for them every day, every year, right? At the same time, yes, you also take care of the aerial flooding that might happen in the area because of, I don't know, some heavy rain one day. Yeah, this way of working backwards from here are the outcomes that we have deemed unacceptable. Now we need to figure out how to regulate in the right ways to do whatever is possible to ensure that doesn't happen. Seems like the right way to go. You looked at how OpenAI's efforts to mitigate bad outcomes from GPT-4 kind of stacked up against the NIST AI risk management framework. And I think importantly, you and the other authors of this pointed out that while they did some red teaming, the people who were actually doing this decided or felt that red teaming wasn't really enough, but also that OpenAI and all of these companies at this point are really left to rely on their own judgment instead of having a bit more of a stringent standard of, well, you've produced a system and, you know, there, there is a conceivable world in which it teaches somebody who didn't know before how to create a bioweapon who really wants to. And, you know, even if the information is stuff they could have found out on the internet, well, the point of this thing is you can ask it and it'll serve you all of that on a silver platter. And it's much easier for you to get to that than it would have been otherwise, which is very, very important in this discussion, I think. And so there does seem to be this mix of things where you have different sorts of suggestions. One thing you brought up is that dichotomy between do we regulate use? Do we regulate the basic technology? Jeremy Howard, I think, kind of thinks that regulating the basic technology is something that you can't do. Connor Leahy has made suggestions that if OpenAI and so on were to publicly commit that they're not going to train systems more powerful than GPT-4, to commit to not scaling their models further, but rather focus a lot of their effort on just aligning these models, making them into products, distributing them, not building autonomous agents on top of them, that he would be in a happier place when it comes to his thoughts on safety. And so it seems like there's a, a big mix of suggestions here. And I kind of see you as as you said earlier, landing in the middle of some of these, where maybe in some respects, you do have to regulate a basic technology, but then you also, of course, have to regulate that use at the end of the day. And so I, I guess there are kind of two directions it stems from. One is, what are the acceptable and unacceptable outcomes of the technology? Two is, what is maybe the, the nature of that technology as a dual use technology? Do the bad impacts come from the existence, the capabilities that the technology will have itself, how much of that is an artifact of that, how much of it is the way people are using it. I, I just threw a bunch of complicated thoughts and questions at you there, but I am curious how you respond to a lot of the contemporary discourse on this, I guess maybe specifically to speak to the technology versus its use discourse, and then also the question of, well, should we think about, should these companies think about, you know, putting a limit on how much they want to scale these models and make them more capable? So uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll start with saying that I, 
I think I agree with Connor that I, I would prefer if OpenAI was not just creating autonomous agents right now. Uh, and it would be nice. It would give the lawmakers some time as well. At the same time, uh, I would also disagree with Jeremy that you cannot regulate the sub source. Like, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's a fair characterization of dual use technologies. Uh, most dual use technologies are often regulated at source for some purposes. Uh, it may not necessarily just be like creating a big licensing regime. There are other ways to do it as well. Right. Uh, and yeah, sure. I mean, there are a lot of issues to figure out with licensing. So I get that. Like I get the hesitance around licensing and I agree that it might lead to some market capture if done in the way that Microsoft is proposing. Uh, now, are there ways we can do it? Yes, sure. You know, uh, do I know the right answer? Probably not. I'll, I'll accept that, uh, you know, I, I wear that, uh, wear that humility with pride that I don't know the right answer is there. And I don't think most people do. Uh, uh, it's going to be a deliberative process. I would say that we regulate a lot of technologies at source. We regulate high risk chemicals. We regulate nuclear material. We regulate, you can't build a nuclear power plant today if you're a private company without having an agreement with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So that is a form of licensing that happens, right? Now, I would say like there are ways to do things. I think there is merit in most of the proposals. I do think, however, that people need to spend way more time right now, way, way more time in refining what those proposals are going to be, like what the implementation challenges are. How do you, you how do you like put yourself in the hand uh and put yourself in the uh, in the shoes of you know uh, the agency you are tasking to regulate something and see what challenges emerge and how are you going to come up with responses to that don't don't come up with like just fantasies of hey maybe we will have like uh, you know semiconductor companies put something on their GPUs uh, that will tell us whether an AI model is being trained or deployed. I mean, come on, like that technology, one, does not exist. Two, it is a, it's potentially like also a big issue around surveillance and uh, privacy. Uh, the, the third thing, like even if it did exist, like how are we going to tell the difference between AI models and gaming engines, whatever. Like, you know, rather than coming up with fantasies uh, of, hey, how this is how I would like things to be. Let's just try to figure out what we have right now. Like you, you propose this licensing thing. You propose this, uh, I don't know, some other fanciful idea uh, of let's say let's say export controls, which is in my view a very good idea. We we know how to do export controls, just probably don't know like how to do them well on software yet. Like it's it's something you can put on a thumb drive, right? Like. How are we going to do export controls on something that we can put on a thumb drive? It is hard, uh, but maybe we can figure it out if we spend, I don't know, if we all spend like more time thinking about how to implement rather than just coming up with new ideas. Uh, so that is one thing I would say. The other thing I would say, like in terms of like how Congress will have to figure out this, this distinction between regulating at source versus regulating at the use case. Uh, I'm going to say that it is not going to be versus, as I said earlier, it's most likely going to be and that we are going to put some, like we already have things that we are putting at the, uh, at the source, right? Like there are risk management frameworks that we put together. The cybersecurity RMF, for instance, uh, became the de facto standard for cybersecurity around the world. Like, uh, I imagine, uh, you know, whatever updates to the Nest AI RMF happen, they will have more teeth than the RMF does right now, hopefully. Uh, uh, or we will establish newer standards uh, for like frontier AI models. Like there, you know, what what if we were to establish standards uh, for models? Let's just let's say we define any model that 
has the ability to uh, cause significant impact on to economic stability, uh, space-based infrastructure, critical infrastructure, civil rights, national security. Uh, that we define standards for their development and deployment. That we ask the subject matter experts at NIST to come up with standards for those. Uh, all the things they need to do around risk management. Great. It's like, uh, and in fact, I'll tell you, there is a member of Congress who's thinking around those lines right now. Now, some people are calling for self-certification. Uh, that is the other thing that's being floated. Oh, look, there are so many companies. Government does not have all the talent or the know-how to do it. So let the companies self-certify. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, the government didn't have to get pilot's license to create the FAA or administer it. You know, they hired a lot of people who know how things are done at the FAA to go and inspect uh, the planes, go and inspect the plane crashes. And uh, look at how FAA has led to like a drastic reduction in uh, airplane accidents, or uh, airplane incidents, uh, aviation incidents. So like, I, I think uh, that's my view that Congress can do a lot of things, should do a lot of things. It is, it is going to, like a lot of things will not work on the first try. And we have to just admit, we have to accept it. Like that is the nature of proactive regulation, of anticipatory regulation. Like there will be things that we will miss and we'll update that. We'll, you know, we'll iterate over it. It is going to be a continuous process. It's not that we'll solve AI policy in the next year. It is going to take decades. Yeah, and I, I think this way you put it of we really need to get better at being very specific with where are we starting from? What are the tractable issues we want to solve? And articulating those in a very realistic way, as opposed to just imagining something way out there in the future that could or could not happen, that people can't really tie to anything specific happening right now. It seems like a much better way to go about things. I, mean, I, I, I say this thing, like, if you can't explain... Like, if you can't explain something to me in less than five sentences, uh, you've lost the plot. Like, imagine a member of imagine a member of Congress who has to go and explain his vote to his or her vote to a constituent in West Texas, uh, say, and the constituent is a middle aged white man with no college degree working construction. Now you have to explain it to them. Why did you do something the way you did? You know, you have to make it relatable in that way, right? They are concerned about jobs, right? Uh, oh, is this going to take away my job? Like that's the biggest thing people are concerned about. So let's let's put it in relatable ways. People are concerned about deep fakes. Uh, let's put it in a relatable way. You know, one of the things uh, I, I saw someone doing on the Hill was like put out deep fakes of uh, the map, like show members of Congress their own deep fakes where they were saying something that they never said. They were terrible. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is really interesting. One related aspect I wanted to get your thoughts on, and you've already brought this up both in this conversation and in your Vox article, is about the differences in terms of, well, we might want to focus when it comes to policy on some of the more concrete harms we see today, like deep fakes, disinformation versus a lot of the X-risk narratives that especially today seem to be getting so much airtime. And I think Ezra Klein also made a pretty good point about X-risk recently that I liked when he was, I think, really pushing some of the folks who believe in it deeply on, hey, like, what is what is your theory of change? And the way he put this was, if the people who claim to be deathly worried about X risk, were really, really worried about it, and they really wanted the regulations that they deemed so necessary, then instead of building stuff in SF, they would be with you up on Capitol Hill, trying to get their voices heard, and connecting with the right people, doing the coalition building. And so I'm curious how you think, again, about that role of X risk arguments in conversations about AI governance. You've already spoken about this a little bit, but I think some of these arguments about what is the theory of change, if there is a way for X risk people, if they are really so worried to articulate themselves 
and actually develop a theory of change. It's a free country with free speech. So uh, I, I think you're welcome to use the phrase X risk. Uh, I think at the same time, like there's, there's this joke that goes around in DC, like quite often these days uh, where people often say, uh, we missed the second part of the letter where OpenAI agreed to commit like half of its profits to, uh, or half of its uh, revenue to doing AI safety uh, policy making. Uh, so anyways, like, I, I think I don't dismiss, uh, their concerns. Uh, I just view it as not productive to talk about in terms of policy making. There, there are smarter people than I am, uh, you know, who, who have given some thought to things. And I, I personally am not totally inclined on X risks or, but I do think that people would, things would be much, much better in terms of both the discourse and policy making, the ease of policy making for members and everything. If we were talking more concretely in terms of proximate catastrophic risks that could arise. Now, look, we have a, we have an election coming up next year. There is a lot of anxiety around what could happen with disinformation coming originating from Russia or China. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a big, big, there's a lot of anxiety uh, around deep fakes, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's not even a hypothetical The DeSantis campaign used two deep fakes of Donald Trump in their recent advertisements. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people want to think about that. Like uh, imagine rogue actors or terrorist organizations using deep fakes to create instability in fragile democracies. That would be a big, big risk to, uh, like it would be a catastrophic risk in my view. Uh, same goes for creation of biological agents or chemical weapons, uh, new pathogens. And mm-hmm. those are things that people actively think about on the Hill every day. You know, one of the bills that they're going to pass is reauthorizing the pandemics and all hazards preparedness act preparedness and response act. Uh, it's the Papa, like it, Papa is, it's up for reauthorization. It is, you know, scale, uh, getting the federal government's capacity back up, scaling it up, uh, reauthorizing all the authorities the federal government has in terms of addressing, uh, potential harms from biological agents and potential preventing potential pandemics. Right. Let, let's talk in terms that people can understand. Not everybody is, you know, creating GPT-4. Not everybody is Yashua Bengio. Uh, and not everybody is going to understand what you're saying. So try hard to come up with simpler arguments to like, I think here's just me putting my view out that more or less the responses are going to be the same things. They're going to be incredibly boring things like stronger risk management frameworks, some some form of pre-deployment risk assessment, stronger cybersecurity measures, uh, you know, putting in stronger guardrails around uh, gene synthesis, like the bill that I worked with Senator Markey and Senator Budd on, uh, and Senator, uh, Representatives Eshoo and Crenshaw introduced in the House on gene synthesis and, uh, and, and similarly, there will be like third party auditing mechanisms. We don't have a federal data privacy law right now. That is going to be another thing that we need to think of. Uh, I think at the end of the day, like we will have to pull all these levers to reduce, like to minimize the risk. There is hardly a chance we will ever get to zero risk, you know? We will minimize the risk, new kinds of things will emerge, like someone will find a loophole around them, we'll fix the loophole, we'll move on. And I think the answer to like both current and proximate catastrophic risks, as well as current, just like current risks normally, and what is being said about existential risk. I think there is much more in common in terms of what the solutions are than what it appears when people just like engage in Twitter fights.
are X fights now. So uh, I think like it it would be much much more beneficial if these people were like talking to one another because they would they would recognize how much in common there is around the solutions. Uh, so if if I can get the same solution talking about proximate catastrophic risks that a member of Congress can understand, can relate to, their staff relates to, they can, you know, convey it in less than five sentences. I'll use that argument rather than talking about X risks that to them seems like sci-fi. I think you're absolutely right about this. I think perhaps a good place for, for us to close on a related note here is maybe bringing this point just to our broader conceptions of and discussions of AI. You spoke about the ways in which we represent the issues we're trying to deal with in a policy context and how useful that can be for getting dealing with the right types of regulations. And of course, your Vox article, importantly, is titled that panic about overhyped AI risk can re- lead to the wrong type of regulation. And I think that it really serves as a warning for us. I mean, you started off your introduction with that recent Air Force simulation that we all saw, where eventually the story became that this wasn't actually a simulation, it was a thought experiment. But that still very quickly created these sensational narratives about AI that people probably had to figure out, how do we walk back what we just said here? And it's very possible that there are people out there who didn't hear all the Twitter updates and are still thinking that there was a real simulation that happened. So I guess if if you could leave us with some words on just what do you think about the ways in which people who are writing about AI, who are doing research in AI, how they can articulate themselves a little bit better or in a way that's more conducive for regulators, for people who are out there who are doing this work, who have to make it comprehensible to people doing policy, how people in the AI space can maybe make their jobs a a little bit easier and make things more explainable. Yeah. uh, Okay. First, I did not pick the headline. (laughs) Uh, We never get to pick the headline. Uh, The the editors pick them. uh, We only see them when the pieces are out, uh, which, which is always a, you know, pleasant surprise to see something like that. Yeah. The the nice thing was like, it it got published on July 3rd. Uh, I was the, fourth of july weekend so i hadn't even sent the article around but then on fourth of july i saw senator john Cornyn tweeted out the piece which was which was great it's a nice surprise Um, yeah but uh to the to the point of the uh, the story about the simulation right like it it was quite something it it's like there is this massive demand of ai articles like i i frequently talk to reporters uh who are covering science and tech or you know uh politics or Congress, like there is, they're getting a lot of pressure too about like writing more about a, more AI stories. Uh, so anyways, like, and, and this wasn't the first time this happened either, right? Like the, uh, the, oh, there is like an unsubstantiated story. Like the, the critical detail missing in the first story was that the Air Force had not even commented yet. Like, you know, the business insider who originally reported the story had reached out to the Air Force for comment. And the Air Force had not responded to the comment yet. I think it might have been okay for them to wait a day for the Air Force to respond to them with a comment before putting the story out. That's just my view. Uh, maybe the insider takes a different view. Uh, but this happened in 2017 for those of us who were around. And a lot of times in between. Like the, I, I like the 2017 story. Uh, like it was, oh, Facebook shut down its chatbots because they came up with their own language. I remember this. It was just so much panic. And the Sun uh, tabloid style paper in London, in, in England had this piece where they, they had like this infographic of two androids talking to each other in gibberish language, <laughs> which was like, okay, you're, this, is, this is getting a bit too far. But when people talk about AI, I think... Don't assume you know it all. Uh, like I don't know it all. Like honestly, like let's let's just have some humility when we're talking about things. Let's all try to spend some time in other people's shoes uh, to see, like a member of Congress, uh, or their staff, they're getting thousand pieces of information about one thing. 
they're drinking from 10 fire hoses at a time today. Let's try to distill the information for them as much as we can. And secondly, let's try to see the world from other people's perspectives, like uh, who may not be as privileged uh, as we are. Let's try, I don't know, maybe spend like a, a week uh, talking about AI to students in community colleges, right? Uh, see what they think about the opportunities and the risks. You know, uh, let's talk to high schoolers in public schools. Uh, I spend uh, two days a week teaching AP computer science principles at a DC public schools, uh, D- DCPS high school. So, you know, it's a multilingual school. Like those kids are great. They are, they, they talk about, they talk very smart about these things. So too, like they, they follow the news and everything, but at the same time, they, they have a lot of questions. And they asked, like, can you tell me how extinction would happen? I don't know the answer. So I think maybe more people need to be doing that. Like, talk to people who are who are not as engaged as you are. Try to listen to them. Try to answer their questions. Go out there. Be in the community. I don't know. Spend, spend a week in rural Kentucky where people have lost their jobs to automation previously. Talk to them what their concerns are. And how can you, I think that will be much, much more beneficial to people. I think I spent a lot of time talking to people in districts and states, uh, primarily red districts, red states, to better understand the perspective of why are people talking a particular way about immigration policy the way they are, right? And it helped shape my worldview a lot. So I think it would be much more beneficial on AI as well. I think this is a, a great set of pieces of advice to close on. Devyanj, I, I want to thank you. Um, I think also probably on behalf of many of our listeners for the difficult work that you're doing. And I really appreciate your perspectives and, and the time you took to speak with me today. So thank you again for this. Thanks, Daniel. This is great. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.